Hi everybody, it's Dr. Patricia Coughlin, clinical psychologist, uh, ISTDP therapist, teacher, writer, and I wanted to follow up on the last video. I got a question from a subscriber are asking if there are any dangers involved with taking a stand as a therapist, taking a side. So let's break this down. What do I really mean by this? First and foremost, I'm talking about you having a stand, you taking sides for health, growth, challenging yourself and your patients to work at your highest level of capacity, and against anything that is destructive. So you need to be clear about that so you know where and how to focus. Um, I actually see all too often therapists who almost turn this on its head. They seem to be supporting unhealthy defenses and actually casting doubt on the patient's healthy strivings. So again, first and foremost, it's important that you know the difference between health and pathology, between authentic connection and self-expression and defensive, destructive ways of relating to self and other. But I think what this subscriber was really talking about is if we as a therapist, in a sense, come on too strong and we're clear about our stand, which side we're taking, we can actually get into an interpersonal battle with the patient instead of facilitating an internal battle, which is really what we want. And of course, that is a danger. And I have a couple of examples of this. So first of all, when it comes to being clear about what's constructive or destructive, I'm thinking about a session I had uh, last year. I think it was actually the last session before the lockdown. Um, and a patient came in in tremendous distress, massive anxiety, uncontrollable shaking. Um, and he also reported that internally there was a very fierce self-attack going on, including things like, you should just kill yourself. And he seemed to really be sinking under the weight of this and was taking a helpless, resigned position. He was saying, this is just the way I am. So my first task was to help him see that how he was feeling was the inevitable result of defenses he was using. It was what he was doing, not who he is. So I said something like, you know, this seems really torturous, right? The way that you're relating to yourself, all this tensing up around your feelings, attacking yourself, threatening yourself with extinction, basically. You know, I said, can we agree that that's really a destructive and torturous way to treat yourself. And he kind of threw up his hands and smiled. He said, sure, we can agree. Now, you're not going to accept that, right, <laughs> as genuine agreement. Again, he's in a defensive position. And so I said to him, no, I, I really mean it. I, I want us to look at this. Um, would you agree that this is really uh, a very harmful way to relate to yourself. And then he calmed down, got serious, and he said, yeah, it, it really is. And so then can we agree on the task, which is to get to the bottom of that? Could we understand what's driving this? Let's look at when this all started, what triggered it. And this really highlights the aspect of the therapeutic alliance that research suggests is most often missing. And that's agreement about the task. You know, you often agree, yeah, depression is the problem. The goal is to be free of depression. But how you're going to get there, patient and therapist often have very different ideas. So it's really crucial that you're getting agreement about that task, right? And that's what I had to do with this particular patient. But then I'm thinking of another one where 
I could sense, uh uh-oh, we're getting into a tug of war here. The conflict is starting to be between me and him instead of him and him. So this was a patient who, in the middle of the pandemic, um, came in reporting some really risky behavior that he was engaging in, um, having unprotected sex with a number of strangers uh, during a time when infections uh, for COVID, never mind, right, sexually transmitted diseases, um, w- was really at its uh, apex. And so I said to him, you know, this sounds like it's really risky and uh, pretty dangerous. And he started to minimize, rationalize, justify. And I was really casting doubt on those defenses. And then he started pushing back, right? So he started to defend his defenses and want to get into a battle with me. So at that point, I realized, whoops, you know, uh, I got to drop the rope here. I don't want to get into a battle with him. And so I said to him, okay, uh, it sounds like you're saying you feel fine about this. It's okay with you. Uh, But luckily, he had started the session by reporting a dream in which he was behaving like a psychopath. And he woke up from the dream extremely distressed. So while he came in saying, gee, I've had a great week, I had a lot of fun, I hooked up with these people, right? He's also saying, ooh, but then last night I had this dream and I woke up feeling terrible. So to me, that's his unconscious speaking, right? And he's having a conflict between his conscious mind saying, it's all fine, and then his unconscious, which was clearly uh, alarmed and uh, trying to communicate with him. So again, instead of having it be between me and him, I said, okay, so you're saying, you know, you think this is fine, you're okay with it, Uh, but then you had this dream, right, which you found very distressing. What do you make of that? And then he said, well, obviously, there's another part of me, right, that's really not okay with this. So then we had it back between him and him and not between me and him, okay? So this can happen, right? When you're really clear about your stand, right? You can end up getting into a conflict with the patient. So at that point, I would say, drop the rope and refocus on the patient's internal conflict. Of course, that said, there are exceptions, right? Where I can remember, you know, in some ways, this is the essence of the head-on collision, but where the patient is really identified with their defenses, it's syntonic, um, and they're continuing to operate that way would really prevent um, any therapy from going on. And so if you continue in that way, you're actually going to have a collusive alliance. So I'm thinking about a man years ago who was referred to me because of um, erectile dysfunction. He was having trouble with impotence and his urologist could find no physical cause for this. So he came to see me in the hopes of restoring his sexual function. And as I did the inquiry, it turned out that this man um, was completely detached from his own feelings and from others and, and treated women really as objects And, uh, you know, we ended up looking at this and I said to him, you know, it sounds to me like, you know, your penis actually is connected to your heart and is basically uh, on uh, on strike. (laughs) I was saying I refuse to operate under these conditions any longer. So, you know, are you willing to look at this whole way that you're relating to yourself and others? And he really was saying, look, you know, this is my only goal. I just want to restore my function. I don't want to get into feelings. You know, I don't want to, you know, have like uh, relationships where I'm getting attached and things like this. Okay. So I said to him, number one, I don't work that way. Okay. Uh, So even if it were possible just to extract, right, your sexual feelings uh, through this massive wall of detachment from yourself and others. So even if that was possible, which I don't think it is, um, I'm not interested in doing it. And so you do have a choice. I mean, it's alarming to me 
how often therapists seem to give themselves no choice that if somebody walks into their office and is willing to pay their fee, that they're going to keep seeing them, right? Whether there's anything therapeutic going on or not. And again, that's actually you engaging in a collusive alliance. And so being able to say, I don't do that. Um, I've had people, you know, ask, you know, me to change uh, a diagnostic code so they get reimbursed or something when they really don't fit the criteria. And I say, well, I'm not into in insurance fraud. Um, or something less blatant, right, where a patient really just wants to come in and complain about other people. And they don't want to look at themselves. And I remember saying, look, you know, I'm sure there are all kinds of therapists who would be very happy to take your money to listen to you complain about other people. I'm not one of them. So if you want to work on yourself, I'm open to it. Otherwise, right? So again, this really is both you taking a stand around integrity and also operates really as a head-on collision with the defenses that are creating a resistance to the treatment. So I hope this helps to flesh out and elucidate this issue. It is tricky and, and you can get into a battle um, if you're not careful, right? And if that happens, again, you can get out of it. Drop the rope and refocus on the patient's internal conflict. So I hope this is helpful and I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Bye-bye.